So good morning again, and we're happy to uh, present you the high-level panel, which will be moderated by uh, Jean-Louis de Broer from DG Echo. Over to you, Jean-Louis. I think that I pushed on the right button because there was a red light there, so it means that in principle you should hear me, I hope. Uh, so uh, good, still good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm extremely happy to join you here and to be able to share most of these two days with you. I will not anticipate what we are going to say in the closing session, but of course, for us as ECO, for us as a donor, the outcome of these two days will be quite essential in shaping the agenda of the future. Uh, you've heard other speakers this morning including Monique Paria, uh, who painted with you the background picture. And anyway, why should I? Because you are all professionals and you know exactly what kind of humanitarian situation we are confronted with worldwide today. Uh, so we all, development and uh, humanitarian actor, definitely have to start thinking out of the box. There is no other choice than to start thinking out of the box. And although sometimes a bit fuzzy, a bit sophisticated, the discussion of social protection and social protection networks should be part of this thinking out of the box exercise. Uh, thinking about the topic of today, and viewing that from a humanitarian point of view, what does that mean? It means moving from assistance to solidarity, which is a fundamental difference. And we'll try to explore that together. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to those who have put together the composition of this panel, because I think that we could not have better uh, interlocutors to open this discussion with us uh, this morning. Uh, we have, of course, the academia, and I'm extremely grateful to introduce Professor Onquis with us this morning. We have also distinguished representatives of two countries at ministerial level who do represent situations where, indeed, the challenge of building social protection network is at stake. Uh, a receiving country, Uganda, massively receiving country, are near to one million refugees, if my memory is correct, today, but also in itself already a very vulnerable country. So the challenge for a country like Uganda is to, of course, build a system, offer reception condition, but at the same time using that as a leverage to bring other donors, development donors, on board to develop a system that will really be the, the implementation of the do no harm principle and which would help in a way covering the needs of all vulnerable peoples in Uganda, whether they are Ugandan citizens or refugees. The other situation is the one of Ukraine, where indeed we have there a middle income country uh, with, I mean, a solid system but where still the huge number of IDPs creates an absolutely unprecedented situation, also in terms of solidarity, moving from assistance to solidarity, and relation between the Ukrainian receiving communities and the Ukrainian displaced population. So from that point of view, I think that the experience that will be shared with us this morning could not be more enlightening to help us to launch this debate over the two days. But on the top of that, and she will be our first speaker this morning, we wanted also to be guided by the thinking and by the experience of someone who does not have any ministerial responsibility, who is not coming from the academia, who is not uh, from uh, the uh, operators, humanitarian operators world, the humanitarian community, but is actually someone we should focus on, that is to say, the beneficiary. I'm not very familiar, I'm very new in the world of humanitarian assistance, but 
Sometimes I'm always thinking, but hey, guys, we are completely losing sight of the key interlocutor, which is the beneficiary. The one and only we are all accountable for or accountable to is the beneficiary of our intervention. So therefore, to have with us Judith, uh, who will share with us our experience this morning, was the one and only way for us to introduce our discussion and debate. Before passing the floor to Judith, uh, two uh, housekeeping uh, remarks. First, no picture to be taken this morning for the, during this panel. Second, as far as questions from the audience is concerned, we are going to take only written questions. So if you have questions to ask to whoever in the panel, please, uh, I'm, I'm told that there are papers on the desks. Yes, you wave the paper and someone will kindly pick it up and bring it to the table so that we could have a somewhat steered and organized debate which would allow you to leave this room in time to enjoy your lunch, which we all wish, by the way. Okay, thank you very much for being with us today, this morning. And without further ado, uh, Judith, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. My name is Judith. I'm a refugee from Rwanda. I arrived in Belgium two years ago. My journey was too long and dangerous. There were many moments when I wished I had stayed in my country. It would have been better to die at home where my people would moon me instead of dying in a sea or in a land where nobody knew me, far away from my loved ones. My life was normal and I was happy. I had started my university degrees in communications. My daughter has just turned to two years old. I had dreams and hopes, and I was certain to release all of these dreams after the other step by step, as usual. To be a refugee, I felt like it was an accident in my life. I had to flee because my personal life or security was at risk. Because I witnessed military and men planning the killing of people in my community, that was why I feared. I warned the people. Then I got on the death list by myself. I had knew, I had never thought I would be a refugee one day. The decision to flee was made quickly. My family knew that I was next in line to be killed. A friend of my dad with a business in Turkey took a lot of money from my dad to take me to Istanbul. I arrived in Istanbul in summer of 2015, was with a bag and a telephone just I had in my hands. The mobile phone was only my connection to my parents and my daughter whom had remained behind. Through contacts with other refugees, and I understood very quickly that I would not be able to work or to move freely in a Turkey. I would not hard hold a key to life. I would not be able to survive or to work in Turkey. A group of Syrian men helped me to plan next step. I decided my to pay a lot of money to board a boat that I would take, it would take me to Greece. My Syrian friends who only had small packages told me to put on at least more trousers and more clothes to my body. This would make my bag to be lighter. We took a bus to sea. The bus drivers gave money to, to police they could pass without problems. After eight hours, we arrived at the sea. It was the first time in my life to see the sea. My Syrian friends all had swimming vests, me I had none. When I saw the boat, I only felt fear. It was not bigger than a dining table. And we were 45 people to board on it without children. The smugglers pushed us into the boat 
hitting and shouting to us as if we are thieves. They all had guns. What fears me or what makes me fear? It was early in the morning at five. The boat started to sink in the water. Then the smugglers threw away all my luggages, all of our belongings <coughs> into the sea. My bag and my phone were gone. They sank to the bottom of the sea. I was certain that I was soon to follow. I thought my children and my family, they would never knew where I died. There would be no grave, of course, on the sea, no prayers to say, no candles. My soul would disappear on the waves of the sea. With my phone gone, I could not even send them a last message. I had still much to say, many kisses to share, and much love to, to share as life. We left Turkey, and one day, hour, one hour, Later, after leaving Turkey, the engine died when we are just stuck on the water. People started to cry, of course, in different languages. More and more, water came into the boat. One hour later, the money re repaired the engine. We continued the trip. When we were close to Greece, the boat hit a lock and it busted. It was like a paper on the waves of water. We were saved by journalists around who were close by us. When we got to the beach, we were so happy because we were saved. <coughs> we hugged and cried. I thought after that I was safe. But when I reached to, the, to get paper in Greece, I thought I would die again. Thousands of people, waves of people, trying to push to get papers from the building offices. And the police were protecting the building, pushing back the crowds of people. I was pushed forward and backward. The weight of people pressed me from the inside. I was certain that I would smushed by the waves of men, women, and children. It was hot, it was so loud, and I had no idea what to do next. My family had not heard from me in days. They must have been so worried, of course, or thinking that maybe I was died. What gave me hope, actually, was the friendship I had with other refugees. Together we planned the next step. We traveled together through many countries with names I have never heard before, on trains which I have never seen before in my life, in my African countries. So we passed through Macedonia, we passed through Serbia, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, and finally we reached in Germany. When we reached in Germany, there were many refugees in Germany. Then one of my friends from Syrians, we, we plan to continue to Belgium, that we had to find at least a place where there is less refugees. We arrived in Belgium in October. We arrived at four o'clock at Gari Dumidi. We are, re we are received by the Red Cross. I was tired and so cold. I had no jacket, but they gave us silver blankets and bread with the drinks. I got a room and I could sleep, I could shower, and I, I got medical treatment. I was like, it was a reborn. I was like a born again. I was recognized after some months as a refugee. Then, from the organization here in Brussels called Convivial, I got a home and so many house staffs, like furniture, bed, and TV. Learn, and they taught me how to use metro, buses, trams, and taught me how Brussels is. 
And from them, I got 100 euros about a phone. I reconnected with my family. At the first time when my father heard from me, he just cried loudly. He cried, I mean, he cried loudly. They had thought I was dead. I took, after that, I had to start, to start a school. I took integration classes. The teacher one day, she said a sentence which helped me that now you are safe. You can be able to release all the dreams you had in life. This sentence, it really helped my life. It was like, it's a key to my life. I would release my dreams step by step. I was able to find work. I'm now ironing clothes. I take French classes. And maybe one day I'll be able to study again. And one day I will be able to be, to bring my daughter with me, live with her, and I know she will be she will not be afraid to take choices which are hard. Thank you. Uh, Judith, what can I say but really thanking you wholeheartedly, and I mean it, for having shared this with us. Uh, I mean, I, well, it's unbelievable. We, 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 we've heard about this story, but we rarely meet people who have been through what you have been through. You are a survivor. You are definitely a survivor. Uh, and uh, I mean, I know how it could have been emotional and difficult for you to share this experience with us. And really, on behalf of all of us, I really want to thank you for this and for the efforts that you made. I will let you go and take a break, but uh, just maybe one question from my side, if you allow me. Uh, you seemingly, the end of your presentation, you said it yourself, I mean, you were you are born again. How do you see your next years? What are your expectations? What are your dreams? What are your wishes? Because I mean, I'm sure that the survivor like you, you will materialize these wishes these dreams? Um, I wish in my next summer years to, to continue my studies and also to have my baby, I stay with her. Those are my wishes. Okay. Yeah. Let's <laughs> pray for it. Thank you very much. So if needed be, I think that we all know exactly why we are here now today. Uh, Madam Minister, I will now turn to you as our first uh, speaker uh, this morning. You are Minister of State for Youth and Children Affairs, Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development of the Government of Uganda. Let me just say a word about this. Uh, and it is not gender correct because, I mean, women should not have the monopoly of speaking about gender issues. On the contrary. But I think that it is also very important that you are in charge of gender issue because I think that we cannot think about social protection network, about protracted displacement situation without having in mind, I mean, the gender dimension of it and the key role uh, that uh, women, mothers, sisters can play uh, with regard to the challenges that we are discussing together for these two days. I think that the gender topic will be quite pervasive during the next years, and it's good that it is the case. So, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean. I'm equally privileged and humbled to be here this morning. Certainly, I'm coming from Uganda as rightly mentioned, and I'm proud to be here as we discuss this very, very important uh, concern of the world in uh, addressing the social protection in the context of fragility and forced displacement. 
You may wish to know, or you might be knowing already, that Uganda has the largest growing refugee rate in the world. To date, we have one million refugees from Southern Sudan, and this is only in the past three years. One million refugees in total as we talk today. But 61% of all these refugees are children. And I talking, I am the minister in charge of children in the country, where 58% of all the people in Uganda are children below the age of 18. <coughs> so Uganda has an open door refugee policy. It's, as said, a receiving country that has the refugee crisis that actually tantamounted into hosting the refugee summit that has just been held in Uganda just a couple of weeks ago. We in Uganda are now looking at establishing a child sensitive protection system to all families with children, both Uganda families and refugee families. We have worked with and we have a long-term vision to sustain cash grants over the next 25 years to all families with children. Looking at the innovative financing model that would pull <laughs> funds from multiple sources domestically and internationally would sustain grants over the long term. In this, we are looking at both preventive and sustainability modules to ensure that we guard against the side effects that we've been receiving in the country, such as insecurity. We have over four main refugee camps, but what is happening now is the high rate of insecurity around the camps. The people in the camps are fighting with the host communities around, and the fighting is so grave to that it's causing a lot of insecurity within the country. And the other scourge is probably the climatic change, which is affecting the local population to the extent that it is impinging the work that the good that would be offering to the refugee communities as we were doing primarily. This system would have a key impact on bridging the humanitarian development nexus, especially humanitarian to strengthen resilience to families against shocks in other conflicts of climate related development and help in lifting people in Uganda out of poverty, especially children. We in Uganda are therefore viewing social protection as a key strategy to represent, to, to respond to school dropout and a breaking and intergenerational cycle, of breaking the intergenerational cycle of poverty. 55% of all the children under five are living in multidimensional poverty. They are deprived of many or two basic services of i.e. health, nutrition, education, etc. Furthermore, 38% of the six, six to 17 year old are living in poverty as well. We launched a social protection investment uh, case last year to expand social protection that showed stunning results. We evaluated a senior citizen's grant, which you very well know about, which has been providing $6 per month to households with senior citizens in 15 districts in Uganda. <coughs> results showed that households that received the grant had achieved the following. One, they had tripled their school enrollment rate. They had doubled the livelihood of having two or more meals per day. They had 50% increase in the employment rate. And finally, nearly four times higher median wage. We have also micro simulations of different social protection schemes in future, including but not limited to, one, a senior citizen's grant, two, a grant for people with disabilities, three, a health insurance scheme, four, and then a child support grant. The results showed that all, all these have major and accelerating major impact and accelerating Uganda's socioeconomic development 
in particular, the child support grant will, has shown the greatest impact, will show the greatest impact. A universal grant that we are proposing now is to give $6 per family, in particular the family that has any child below the age of two. And that would reduce the Uganda's national poverty rate by 28%. And we have a reason to believe that it could be much higher, even above 50% later. And also, it will reduce the rivalries of poverty that children experience by at least 32%. We therefore are now looking at establishing a sustainable financing system to sustain a child support grant for the next two decades. More specifically, we are suggesting an endowment fund that will pull finances from multiple sources such as the national budget, the Uganda private sector, the digital financing, that is the mobile money, the development partners, foundations and philanthropists, and the social impact investors. We have worked out that it will need 2.6 billion US dollars, an endowment fund to sustain a child support grant over the long term. We are now developing key partnerships to this system off the ground, and we have just been out to, to the US, and now we're proceeding to UK to ensure that we hit the ground by next year. More specifically, we are looking at starting a pilot next year in the West Nile region, that is the upper part of the country, where 95% of the children live below the poverty line and are deprived of two or more basic needs, which is the region where also one million refugees from southern Sudan have arrived, and we are including over 500 over the last year. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Minister, I thank you for listening to me, and I invite you all to join my efforts in ensuring that we start up as Uganda, we set up a, a model to roll out to the rest of the common, to the rest of the member states that are hit hard by this scourge, so that we start up a child support grant to ensure that no child is left behind. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Minister. I mean, I was really impressed listening to the presentation of the plans of your government. I mean, uh, the comprehensiveness, I mean, targeting different categories of population, not only children, of course, but also senior citizens, people affected by disabilities. I mean, all that have to be factored into our discussion later on today or tomorrow. Uh, also, impact measurement, performance measurement, something very important that you said and that is sometimes forgotten by governments, including on this side of the world, is that social investment is a contribution to economic development which is absolutely essential and a message that we have to bring back uh, home or, or uh, keep, keep in our discussion. Also in terms of source, of source of funding, private sector, philanthropy, I assume that you mentioned also diaspora, I mean digital money, I like that also. So all that I think is really things are on which I wish uh, all of us to elaborate also during the specific uh, panel session that will take place this afternoon. Last but not least, you are planning for the next two decades. By definition, we are now working in the long term. I mean, it's way beyond uh, the six months emergency intervention that we are dealing with. And I think that this vision has also to be kept in mind when further discussing the setting up of social protection network. Let me now turn uh, to uh, Deputy Minister Alexandra Shurkina. I mean, you are in charge of social policy for European integration and social policy more in general in the government of uh, Ukraine. Uh, I mean, uh, who could have even thought uh, three years ago that there would be humanitarian inter intervention in Ukraine today. Uh, but okay, circumstances are such that your government is also confronted with an unprecedented challenge. And we are engaged together with you. I mean, not later than uh, Tuesday next week. Uh, I'm gonna be together with colleagues in Kiev, where we're gonna have a series of exchange with your government, with local authorities, with local partners, in view of setting up exactly the kind of agenda that you will uh, present us uh, this morning. Uh, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, very happy and proud to be here with you today. It's a great pleasure. 
and I would like to present perspective from Ukraine. And as I can see right now, uh, it will be sort of a follow-up of morning opening remarks. So, uh, the presentation will include six main blocks. I'd like to present key features and the existing system, uh, to describe uh, recent trends, to talk on protracted conflict, uh, to look on uh, achievements. Uh, uh, also, I would like to highlight uh, the way forward and uh, to define some ideas how to make it reality. The Ukrainian system of social protection is forced to cope with old and new challenges in very difficult times. I'm trying to unpack this statement during my presentation. I call this slide accumulated promises. So what I would like to highlight this, um, we need to remember uh, that the social protection system was inherited from the Soviet Union. So features of the system are similar as on the post -Soviet, other post-Soviet Union countries. Pensions, institutional care, health-based approach to disability. And it's important to note that the system has never reached the basic level, rural communities. There are two phases in transition, from the early 19th and the early 2000s, Emergency administrative and normative social protection based on the recognition of liability of the certain categories of population. The third period uh, that actually started from the second half of the thousands is featured by the fragmented introduction of the modern element of social protection, such as social work, foster, etc. I would like to quote what our prime minister said in one of the occasions. Missed reform opportunities since 2004. What I'd like to mention is some uh, and show you some figures that would illustrate uh, all my uh, statements mentioned earlier. 120 types of privileges, 60 types of benefits, 130 categories of beneficiaries. What should I say? I think the figure speaks from themselves. Such type of system has no chance to be effective and efficiency because uh, the promises at all, uh, the no promises at all is equal to, equal bet to promise everything to everyone. Here I would like to speak about uh, new challenges uh, and to find out some figures. First of all, in terms of displaced population, 100, uh, one, one half million people, increased poverty, critical pension fund imbalance, efficiency and effectiveness of cash transfer and energy subsidy, shadow employment, unfunded privileges, new vulnerable categories of population like veterans. There are three things I want to highlight to you very briefly. You can see that poverty has been increased since 2014. Families with children remain to be among the most vulnerable population. And in the structure of household income, social benefits constitute almost 35%, which is not good at all. Here I want to focus more on the conflict. We think that the conflict also unveils systematic weakness. So, the challenges uh, IDPs are facing are the following. Hosting communities often do not have enough capacity and resources to respond to IDPs' needs. System was unready to receive such demand. There is an issue of physical access to services for people living on non-government control areas. So, they basically need to cross uh, the contact line. It is not a secret that there were and there are cases of social exclusion by host communities. And that last but not the least I would like to flag that the lack of employment opportunities is the critical issues for the IDPs.
let's look on the progress made so far and some transitional steps. Since the beginning of the conflict, government made uh, actions to support conflict-affected population. Later on, this has been translated into complex multi-sectoral pro national program to support social adaptation and reintegration of IDPs. It is important to note that IDP response is integrated into regular social pr protection program with adjustment and privileges. For example, prioritize access to services. There is a special grant transfer program introduced that covers rental and utilities expenditures for IDPs. The program is really sizable, 3.2 billion grivnas, and roughly it's around 10% of all social cash transfer budget. To support IDPs, the government also introduced housing program. It covers 50% of cost for apartment or houses that IDPs want to buy. I would like to stop on the latest development. There is a draft legal amendment that led to the pension legislation. And the main point is to simplify access for IDPs, reestablish the pension right including accumulated debt for the individuals. Let me provide some small example. If someone is not getting his or her pension during any period of time, once the person gets the access to services, the government pay all the debt. There are two other important uh, points regarding achievement that was done before. In all the process, government receives significant support from our development and humanitarian partners. Another support came from the volunteers movement that started from 2014. Individuals and group of individuals did a lot of support uh, to IDPs through all the country. I would like to walk you through some figures and data. As you can see the first diagram, the number of registered IDPs has declined. I need to focus your attention that registered numbers is not equal to actual number. The data I present is IDPs registered by the Ministry of Social Policy System. I would make few assume hypothesis on the decline number. A. I assume that the number has declined because some of IDPs leave or migrate the country. B, improved verification from the state side. Those who got the status on the wave of real IDPs after the improving verification cleaned up. And C, the last hypothesis that the figure shows us is stabilization trend. You can see it by the end of 2016 and the uh, April 2017. My second diagram show you the geographic lo location of IDPs. As you can see, the five regions receive the majority of IDPs. Why? The region are bordering the contract line and the IDPs has to willingness and hopes one day to return their homes when the territory will be under Ukrainian control. Last diagram shows the coverage improved. In the first slide, we see the numbers of registered IDPs decline, but the number of IDPs recipients of special cash transfer increased. So, where do we go? Now I would like to share with you our vision of the transform of social protection system in Ukraine. We firmly believe that we need to move towards integrated social protection system. The system is to be based on the following core principles. They are solidarity, subsidiarity, inclusion, and service integration. And frankly speaking, uh, it was a great pleasure to hear from you, Zhang Li, about uh, transfer to the solidarity. I don't want to lecture you, uh, but I really need to explain you our philosophy by unpacking the first two core principles. If social is anything related to interpersonal relationship, it cannot be built on individualism or mass-based formula only. <coughs> on the contrary, it should assume solidarity among all players 
involved in the social relationship. And the second, the word subsidiarity comes from the old Latin term subsidium affair, that means to help. But to help is a very particular way. Empower the autonomy and potential capacities of the beneficiaries undertaking only those initiatives that exceed the capacity of individuals. As for the key elements of integrated social protection, we are based on European meta model. And here you can see the six main pillars of ISP for Ukraine. Integration of individual level, integration on service level, PFM, also PFM that will consider the risks, data management integration, physical level integration, and of course policies and programs level. The role of the central government will be the still important, especially in the policy level. But local governments are become critical actors in the integrated system. So the current decentralization reform in Ukraine is a unique opportunity. Objectives of the decentralization and ISP reforms are mutually reinforcing. It means that the success of decentralization reform is greatly depend on the ability of local government to develop strong social protection system. I would like also note that we do believe that the system will help us to efficiently and sustainably address the whole spectrum of complex social protection issues, old, existing, and upcoming. But it's not a silver bullet. It's a very interesting uh, that the crucial, crucial block of ISP system, his management, was significantly strengthening in humanitarian modality. Here is a small example. We have Mariupol city in the eastern region of Ukraine, and they are champions in the case management, including through IT technology. <coughs> context. You know, context really matter. We need to remember that other process happening in the country. Political turbulence, macroeconomic stability is still to be achieved, ongoing territorial reform and decentralization that I mentioned before, ongoing social reforms, health and education. So, maybe it is a good that reform of social protection in Ukraine has started from the small R. But, to become a big R from the second half of 2018. Few thoughts how to make it reality. A. Eastern Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine to accelerate the reform agenda in social protection, also learning from humanitarian experience. From my personal experience, I visited a lot Eastern region many times before and after the conflict, uh, the majority part of Eastern regions need development support and development programs with humanitarian experience. B, focus on change management. There are three main stages of any changes, innovation, technology, and tradition. Frankly speaking, uh, we usually fall in the technology stage. And I do believe Ukraine is not the exception. Too many innovations, and many of them do not translate into tradition. C, reform can be scaled up horizontally. And D, partnership. Dear colleagues, partnership is more than a strategy. And here, using the occasion, I would like to thank all our partners, European yeah. Union programs, international financial institutions, UN family, bilateral partners, and civil society. Actually, some of them are not only supporting Ukraine, they are also organizing this great event. So thank you very much. Many thanks to all of you. And thank you for your attention. Uh, we, we, sorry, we owe you a big thank, uh, Madam Minister. I mean, uh, listening to you, uh, I was thinking that after all, it was uh, good that we have 
your two countries uh, next together in this first presentation, although with a completely different background and a completely different history, because there is one major similarity. That you say that these two countries were confronted with what you label systematic weaknesses yes. and that were hit by a crisis in terms of displacements or uh, war brought into the country that uh, came out on the top of these systematic weaknesses. And you are <coughs> making actually use of this crisis. There is, some, uh, there is no such thing as, 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 as a bad crisis. I mean, you are always, make, make, both of you are trying to make use of this crisis to at the same time uh, remedy uh, these systematic uh, weaknesses. Thanks a lot for your kind words with regard to the external support and the donors. I mean, we know that we are not up to uh, where we should be. I mean, the humanitarian dimension of the situation in Ukraine is some sometimes completely lost sight of, uh, but uh, it has to be uh, reminded, and, and you did it. I think that what you said about your four principles is absolutely essential and, again, should guide the deliberation uh, during the next uh, few uh, uh, hours and, and panel session. Uh, I, I, I was struck also, I'm already bringing something, some, some of your thought back in another context. Uh, what uh, you are doing is a bit similar to what we are doing, but from a strictly humanitarian point of view, today in Greece with the Estia program, where we have, to, with, in close partnership with HR, both uh, housing and uh, cash transfer benefiting to the Syrian refugees. And the challenge for us is now to foresee an exit strategy, which would transform that humanitarian uh, uh, program into part of the Greek uh, social <coughs> protection network. And that's exactly the kind of challenge that uh, you are now uh, 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 successfully, uh, I mean, meeting uh, in, 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 uh, in Ukraine. So again, for this, for this, for this uh, uh, food for thought, uh, thank you very much. Let me now turn to the last uh, speaker of the panel. Uh, Gohan, first you have to accept my apologies. Uh, I don't know why I presented you as representing the academia. I did not want to insult you. Uh, uh, you are, uh, I mean, uh, you are actually, I mean, one of our uh, distinguished representatives of the donor community. You are head of the Department for Asia, Middle East, and Humanitarian Assistance uh, of the SIDA, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. Uh, SIDA and Sweden are well known to be usually on the forefront of innovation in the area of development policy and innovation. And that is also the reason why it was useful at the end of this morning uh, panel to have the view of a donor of donor donors who is engaged uh, as we would like as ECO to be uh, in the development of this new integrated tool bringing together the resources of the development and of the humanitarian uh, approach. Thank you very much. Thank you so much and for this opportunity to participate in the discussion and uh, to do it be just before lunch with the additional challenge of keeping everybody awake. I'll do my best. Um, I, I, I'm now the director of a department of SIDA which manage all, the, all our humanitarian aid plus the long-term aid to Middle East and to Asia. So the well-known uh, humanitarian development divide runs kind of through my own department. Um, and uh, I must confess then that I, I think I'm, I'm in the position in a way where my mind is a bit of a crossroad between many of the tensions and dilemmas that this conference intends to bring out. Until very recently, I was actually in academia in the sense that I was working with Sarah Cook in Innocenti in, in, in Florence, managing a group of researchers. And, and as you know, there's also a, a well-known uh, research to policy divide. And, and I'm in the middle of that divide as well, moving from one setting to the other. And then finally, uh, I, in preparation for this new job, I actually spent a full week in northern Uganda. Um, and one of these days, thanks to UNICEF and WFP, I was allowed to set up a, a round of, of, of um, focus groups with cash, cash transfer recipients among the refugees. And as you know, sitting, just talking to people marks your mindset more than reading loads of reports. So that's another confession on where I come from right now. So I'll share a bit. First, what, what do you bring with you from meeting round after round of focus groups, speaking to cash transfer recipients, refugees in northern Uganda? These were people who had arrived since 2013, more or less. They had opted for choosing for cash rather than food rations. The, the, the choice was actually given to them. Um, and the story they told me were basically quite encouraging. 
uh, in the sense that the system as such was working well, cash was delivered, and people understood there were complaint mechanisms in, in place. There were markets where you could buy food and the markets were coming closer, I think as a result of the program as well. Uh, I asked, uh, isn't it a problem that cash gets stolen? And the answer was, no, it's the other way around. Food gets stolen. It's difficult to store one month food ration in, in a place where you can't even look up things. Well, cash, you can carry it with you, you can hide it away. Um, I asked, uh, would you advise a neighbor who was given the same kind of choice to choose cash or food? And they all confirmed without any doubt, yes, we would give them advice to opt for cash. So the basic kind of things that we read in the reports about humanitarian cash transfer systems, they tended to confirm. So were there any snags, any difficulties? Well, there was one big one that all focus group came back to. It was the strategy for phasing out the cash transfers. Because in Uganda, you get more or less $8 per person a month. And you get that for three years. And after three years, that's cut to $4 per person a month. And after five years, it becomes zero. And they were all concerned about that, obviously. I, I have no intention to... to, to, to um, to put any guilt on the humanitarian actors for this, but for me it illustrated the severe underfunding of the humanitarian system that we have to bring into the picture here. It's quite dramatic. In May, World Food Programme even had to cut the rations into half, so if you were on $4 per month, it turned into $2 per month. So every day, World Food Programme and UNHCR and the Uganda government struggle to provide the basic necessities to this refugee population. The Ugandan system of providing both land and opportunity for work for the refugee population, I think, is, is, is quite unique. It should be applauded, it should be supported, it should be repeated probably as well uh, elsewhere. And hopefully many of these cash transfer recipients could move into a way of living where they could sustain themselves but I think 85% of them are women and children, and some are elderly, and some are disabled, and for sure quite a large group among them will not be able to sustain themselves within three and five years. Um, and that is a challenge. And that's where you would like to see this bridge being built from the humanitarian system to your vision of the Ugandan social protection system. And I, I just hope that you're able to convince many donors to support you and to join these efforts so you have a system that cover both these populations that are in need and the host community sure. and with an equal treat. Um, that's something to wish for and what you brought with you leaving your country actually. Second, moving to the um, research to policy divide. Um, what I bring with me from the years at Innocenti, I think, when it comes to this particular theme, is how much it is actually under-researched and how much more that needs to be done. Um, and that is not about to establish the basics, that cash is cheaper than food or that sort of the basic operation of things can, can work out well in, in many contexts. That, that is fairly well known. But there are so many other issues that has to do with the design, that has to do with the contextual factors, the synergies with other interventions, the cash plus issues, <coughs> the issue of phasing out and what happens to people as you phase out cash transfers. All of that is very important. It would require high quality research with rigor. And humanitarian settings do have methodological challenges for researchers, but they, researchers would also tell us there are methodological alternatives to randomization and so on that might be very difficult in humanitarian settings. Uh, there are ways of establishing high quality evidence for our work. And uh, I think we, people like me in my new position, we should welcome that. We should let researchers do their job. We should make sure that some of all these funding that goes into different forms of cash and humanitarian systems, that some, some fraction of it actually is destined to build and strengthen the evidence base. And we should be patient because researchers are slow. And we should be open-minded and take our time to absorb the findings, even if they don't tell us what we want to 
learn. Uh, so that is a plea from my previous previous employer, and I, I, I try to, uh, I still believe in it. Um, on the humanitarian development divide that runs through my own department, what do we do? Well, we, we try to take that very seriously. It is really a big thing within the organization. And increasingly we see humanitarian people and long-term development people joining forces, um, working together, planning together, traveling together, uh, analyzing contexts together and sometimes doing things in parallel together when, in, when it comes to intervention. All that is very welcome. We see emerging good examples of social protection interventions that enhance resilience, and we see some good examples of humanitarian interventions being built into something that may last for long term. But, but I should also confess that all, that, all of this is, is quite challenging as well. So we have deep divides among us, both in terms of our mindsets uh, our budget line sometimes, and um, also the principles. The principles that humanitarians have, but the principles that sound a bit like Stefan Derkon's principles. Not so hard to reconcile all the time. Uh, and, and I think the long-term vision that long-term development people should have should stay, but being long-term visionary should not mean that we refrain from bold and risky action in the present as well. Because if not, we just end up in inertia. So I hope for that for Uganda as well, that people are ready to push their limits, you know? Everything is not exactly the way we would like it to be. We still should move <coughs> with a vision. I also think I have concluded that it's mainly the long-term development people that need to adjust their perspective simply for the reason that the humanitarian actors and the humanitarian system has to stay quite close to their core mandate, simply for funding, for funding reasons. And others have to move uh, closer to close the gaps that, that are quite apparent. Finally, on Sweden and CEDA, we remain fully committed to the World Humanitarian Summit, to the, great, the grand bargain, to the, which imply increased use of cash in humanitarian settings and to build systems where possible and appropriate. Uh, we are a bit impatient, but that shift is a bit slow. We are impatient to see the UN system work as one system, being able to deliver multi-purpose cash <coughs> as one, delivering as one. That's something we would like to see more of. We are also fully aware that all protection issues in humanitarian settings cannot be resolved by cash alone. And we remain committed to work with our partners who address that whole range of protection issues that we should not dream about cash resolving for us. Thank you so much. Thanks to you, Gohan, for having shown <laughs> us that uh, actually it's possible to survive two schizophrenia at the same time, so, and, and, and to make the best actually out of this uh, double divide. Uh, this being said, I could not share, but share what a, a certain number of uh, highlights of your intervention, severe underfunding, of course. I mean, I mean um, humanitarian funds available worldwide are drop in the ocean compared to the size and the magnitude that we are confronted with and the need exactly like you are doing madam minister in uganda to pool funds and to try to uh, gather as many sources of funding uh, as possible i mean what you refer i mean the phasing out is also a key i mean i'm always struck by how difficult it is for humanitarians to think in terms of exit strategy and although we should think in terms of exit strategy from day one of our intervention, I mean, the exit strategy should be there from the very moment that we enter into a territory or in a situation. And this is very difficult to think about. And of course, I mean, this implies exactly the kind of uh, advice, uh, 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 methodology that you yourself uh, entered at, for instance, that there should not be a sequential intervention, be humanitarian first and development afterwards, but that the two should be there together from the beginning uh, of uh, the, uh, the crisis. Again, I think that this is essential for us 
to keep that in mind during uh, the uh, following hours that we are going to spend together discussing these uh, topics. So uh, this uh, leaves us uh, with uh, 10 uh, minutes until we break uh, for lunch. Uh, thank you very much for those who have helped us. Uh, I mean, uh, I was uh, handed over a few uh, questions uh, to uh, our uh, speakers, not yet to you, Gohan, because I mean, you were still speaking at the time, questions were gathered, but I assume that there will be uh, other ones afterward. I mean, uh, Minister Shokin, I mean, the question which is di directed to you is a bit, with all due respect for the, for the person who has asked it, a bit nasty, so, but I read it. Uh, if you had known before the conflict that it would have happened, how might Ukraine have adapted then the social protection system to be able to respond better? If it worked well, without change, what features helped? Should it, should it, yes, should it really have been possible to foresee what happened in Ukraine? <laughs> oh. Actually, uh, yeah, thank you for the questions. Interesting and uh, for me a lot of thinking about, but uh, First of all, it was unexpected for Ukraine. I could say that the previous system was bad. No, it was quite strong. But the crisis, this is a crisis. If you ask my personal opinion as an expert, I can reply. I think if Ukraine started on the way of integrated social protection system, several years before, and you remember I mentioned the uh, speech from my Prime Minister about uh, missed opportunities. I don't speak about 2004, 2010, 2008. Maybe we had the chance to fix better the IDPs and the, uh, the crisis and uh, to better solve IDPs uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now turning to you, Madam Minister, I have a yes. Uh, okay, I will come to this afterwards. Right, so okay, D three questions for you, Madam Minister. The first one is basically, right, we all support the open door policy of Uganda. How can partners best support you, better than they do, I assume, uh, to ensure access to social protection as well as economic and livelihood intervention that would benefit both host communities, refugees, and the local economic context. In other words, I think that the question boils down to a very simple one. How, what can your partners do that they don't do yet in view of helping you uh, better? Uh, the uh, second question uh, as about the way you are handling different uh, uh, sources, so you are pooling the different resources that uh, you are uh, listing uh, with regard to the, uh, the outreach, for instance, that you do with some governments uh, uh, for the time being. I mean, how does it uh, end up, I mean, does it end up in one single budgetary instrument? How do you ensure distribu redistribution, uh, redistribution among the different priorities of the different fund streams that you collect coming from the private sector? I mean, there, there are input, there are output. How do you, in financial terms, connect the input uh, with uh, uh, the uh, output? And the third question is a more technical one. Uh, is the child support, child support grant also extended to refugee children? And if not, is there a plan to do this in the future? And then we'll turn to other questions to uh, both our uh, ministers. Thank you very much, Jean, and thank you for the, the work well done so far, so good. Um, I'll start with the third one, though I didn't hear the names of the people who asked these questions, but nevertheless, I thank you. The last one was about the child support grant, whether it does include the refugee children or not. Our policies about um, refugees is uh, really very clear that they are more or less like citizens and they fully benefit from the social services that are so provided. So to date, we have close to one million refugee children. And uh, they are spread all over, beyond the refugee camps to remand homes to uh, uh, communities. So it's really hard to separate them from any uh, direct beneficiary with, within the community. So we are looking at these children as well, fully benefiting from the scheme. Two, uh, the other question was about how do I uh, 
what is my advice on how partners could help out in this new model that we are trying to build? First of all, we are seeking for financial support into the program because many of these partners, like you said, none of them has a clear uh, cash, cash grant to the beneficiaries in the refugee camps in Uganda. Mm -hmm. They're more or less uh, items in kind, health, education, infrastructure, legal aid, mission aid. So we have realized that the crisis, the impact is lowering down and we are having less numbers leave the camps. So these people are more or less settlers on a more permanent basis. So we, we recommend for a more sustainable and more impact generating uh, approach. And this we are looking at this grant and we are already having the support of UNICEF on board. It's fully active on this. So we request for the, the other partners to come on board so that we can hit the ground next next year. And um, yes, finally, it was about how we roll down, uh, how we make sure that all this money that comes in, what is the module? So first of all, the regulations are very clear. Any financial, uh, any, f any, any grants of a financial nature are generated through the government central system. But the key partners play their role uh, in kind and we account quarterly and annually, but it's mainly the central accounting system of the government through the Ministry of Finance and then to the local divisions. And at the refugee level, we have the CDOs, we have the probation officers, we have the, the, the re refugee officers from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and finally, the accounting officers through the Ministry of Finance. Thank you very much for this very precise answer. Uh, the two next questions will be uh, for you, uh, Minister, uh, Minister Shokina. Uh, the first one is, after all, very simple. Uh, it relates to your last, I see your last slide, uh, moving from reform with a little r to reform with a big r. Uh, how, do you, how do you think that you will achieve this? What are the key factors that would help you and the, the Ukrainian government to move from this small letter type to this big letter type uh, our letter. The second question is a bit more precise but very important. I mean, the person asking the question is thanking you uh, for bringing up the issue of case management and therefore highlighting the importance of the social work component in a, a strong, in building up a social strong, uh, a strong, I'm sorry, social protection uh, system. Uh, could you therefore tell us a little bit more about the role of social work uh, and social workers in Ukraine and the challenge you have faced in ensuring the continuity along the financial, uh, alongside the financial components of the system? The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your questions. Let's start from the first one. Uh, transition from the small air to the big air. Mm. First of all, we start this process only a year plus something ago. So uh, we start with the working with the local communities, local municipalities. We had piloting in several communities our ideas. And now we need to escalate the process at the national level. That will be our first steps on the perspective to from the small air to the big R. And uh, thank you for the question about social workers and social and case management. It's really very important because it's a crucial component of uh, integrated social protection. And uh, in Ukraine, we start to speak about uh, social workers years ago as a social worker and case management because we have the similar uh, we have people on the similar position, but the limited uh, authorities and the limited uh, numbers of social services they can provide to the population. Uh, now we are in the process of training uh, social workers. Actually, uh, you saw my slide on Mariupol. In Mariupol, uh, they were piloting IT technology for creating uh, IT database uh, to support case management uh, process. Um, challenges, challenges, it's uh, first of all, a lot of needs of population and few number of social workers among the country. Actually, and uh, I need to mention it, that in 2012, uh, we cut it down 
12 thousands of uh, in 2014 sorry we cut it down to a thousand of social workers from the previous government and the newly government now we try to uh, bring them on again to the board and from the financial perspective uh, as i mentioned we had decentralization and decentralization is not only about uh, territorial changes first of all it's uh, budget decentralization and in ukraine for the previous time uh, we have centralized budget, and now uh, we uh, send the budget responsibilities and financial responsibilities for social service, including social workers and case management, to the local uh, local authorities, local budget. In the Ukraine, we use uh, in the PFM we use uh, performance-based budgeting process. So this is our like uh, key component. Uh, to face and to improve uh, the system of uh, financing in public sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then, I mean, a question to uh, you, Goran, which actually refers to the key of your own personal experience. That's to say, what is the best way to reconcile the challenge? Oh, sorry, what is the best way to reconcile the three dimension that you were referring to? That is to say, uh, practice on the ground, policy development, and funding. <laughs> I don't know if I have a good answer to that question, actually. Even a bad um, one. <laughs> even a bad answer. I mean, it's, it's kind of good to move around between these circles, right? You, you, I must say it's frustrating uh, because the, the priorities differ. And you are frustrated because what's important in one setting is less important than in the other setting. But moving in between and having these open doors, uh, I think that's an important element because we do get siloed in, both as researchers and as, uh, as practitioners and as policy makers, and we should avoid that. And uh, I forgot to say that I really welcome the fact that this conference is an opportunity for mingling between researchers, practitioners, and policy makers uh, okay no well a good answer i would I, I would have said the same so it's a certainly <laughs> a good answer uh, now the last question would be for our uh, two ministers uh, and it can really sum up your contributions what are for each of you the three key ingredients to ensure a successful rollout of a social protection system respectively in uganda and ukraine Start with Uganda. Okay. Thank you very much. To me, I look at our security as a key, a very key factor in ensuring that uh, the refugees are in harmony because chances are that where they're coming from are to reasons of insecurity. So more or less, they don't want to, s to find the same situation, but you know, wherever they are going. So Uganda places a lot of emphasis on security, especially around the camps and within the camps. Two, ensuring that the infrastructure and aid has a cash component within it, because you can hardly uh, find the same people having the same problems from, you know, all, all, all around. So we are looking at introducing cash grants to the families within the camps and beyond, so that what is within the camp is more or less similar to what is outside the camp, so that people can feel at home. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, for us, uh, first of all, I will mention about intersectorial cooperation. And uh, what does it mean? I mean that we need to cooperate on three line ministries and three line ways, health, education and social protection to work and to think as one at all levels national and subnational level including coordination uh, during our sectorial reform frankly speaking in ukraine we have the five sectorial reform at the same time the second one is improving the capacity uh, of uh, local communities of case managers of providers of social services those who who will work with people and who contribute to satisfy their needs. And uh, the last but not the least is the human behavior in general. We need to change the human behavior of 
our population to to voice their rights to vote for their services and to understand which services they can apply and how they can get this. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very inspiring answers. Uh, I would I would dare maybe to uh, to to add a four key in four key ingredients that was hinted at repeatedly by Gohan uh, in his intervention, and it might be easier for an outsider to say what I'm going to say now. It's about vision. It's about vision. Building a social protection uh, network, a social protection system which would benefit the most vulnerable, whether they are IDPs, local or refugees, takes an awful lot of time. It's about two generations or two decennia. You mentioned it earlier. Uh, and uh, of course, I mean, I mean, if the vision is not there, there will be shock. There will be setbacks. You refer to the security uh, constraint. They might be, uh, I mean, who God knows what's going to happen in, on, on the, in the, along the conflict line in Ukraine during the next uh, few, few, uh, few years. Uh, God knows what's going to happen in neighboring countries of Uganda during the next few years. I remember at the time, and some of you were associated with that, we were trying to set up a resilience <coughs> agenda uh, in Sahel along the so-called AGIR program. Of course, there have been since then tremendous setbacks because of the security issues because of Boko Haram, because of the Lake Chad region problem. But if we keep, still keep on keeping this issue, if, sorry, if we still forget, if we still keep on forgetting about this vision, I mean, moving uh, from right to left according to circumstances and not having the straight line in front of us, of course, we are never going to achieve anything. So vision and sustainability, I think, are key. I think that none of the four panelists would like uh, to be more of an obstacle between you and your lunch. Uh, so there will be now a few housekeeping assessments by Marie-France. Before uh, Marie-France uh, takes the floor, let me, on behalf of all of you, uh, warmly thank and uh, with a big round of applause for uh, four panelists.